Uh, next speaker we have is uh, Dr. Ivan Maldonado. He is a professor at the University of Tennessee. Anybody from Tennessee here? One person? <laughs> Two people, sort of. One and a half people. Interesting. So he obtained his, uh, his uh, master's and PhD degrees in nuclear engineering from NC State. Um, joined the University of Tennessee in 2007 and also has a joint faculty appointment at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, which has always been very involved in the nuclear business, as has Argon. Um, he does research on advanced reactors and teaches classes on that topic too, so it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say on this topic. Why don't you join me in welcoming Dr. Ivan Maldonado. Thank you, thank you, Larry. It's a pleasure to be here. I think everybody can hear me okay? Excellent, excellent. Um, well, uh, big shoes to fill, literally. Paul has a lot bigger feet than I do. But uh, he's also a fantastic speaker, so it's great to hear, uh, hear him talk. I actually remember when Paul and I used to be the young guys in nuclear engineering. Uh, so we've been in it together for quite some time now. Uh, it's a small community. Uh, like uh, uh, Darren mentioned, um, we, um, I, I have an appointment that includes a uh, part-time gig at Oak Ridge National Lab. And so that, that is a, uh, a new way by which our university has figured out how to pay for professors. They basically sell part of our time. And so I spend two days a week working at Oak Ridge National Lab. And, uh, and I have two bosses instead of one. And so, uh, enough said about that. <laughs> um, what I'm going to tell you a little bit about, um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the current technology and then building toward what I believe to be the, the near term technology in light water reactors. And so, uh, leave, leaving this open for Dave to, to talk a little bit more advanced fuel cycles. So, let's, uh, I'm going to give you a history. And um, I'm going to give you a link of where this talk falls relative to the fuel cycle, the, the talk that Paul gave. Um, then I'm going to tell you a little bit about the U.S. nuclear uh, energy landscape. And so that uh, for those of you not nuclear engineers or not necessarily in the field, uh, this may be new information. I'll tell you a little bit about the uh, current state of the U.S. nuclear industry. The, um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the Generation 3, 3 Plus, and Generation 4 systems, what these technologies represent. And then I'm going to move into what, what we refer to as small modular reactors. We'll discuss some of the benefits um, uh, and, and drawbacks as well of small modular reactors and, and uh, some uh, characteristics and, and specifics about the domestic SMR designs. And we'll summarize and, and, and uh, ask for questions and answers. Uh, at, the, at that time. So, uh, first thing I wanted to know, uh, since I don't know what your backgrounds are, uh, I, I know you don't have a nuclear engineering program, and so uh, the first thing is that nuclear is not news. And so if you go through this list of, I'm not going to read all of these, but uh, you know, dating back to 1903, 1942, you know, I had this uh, first critical um, experiment in, in, at the University of Chicago, so nearby. Um, eventually, the graphite reactor extent when critical in 1943, so you're looking uh, quite quite a bit back in time. Hanford reactor, we talked a little bit a little bit about that, was critical in September 1944, um, before most of most of us were born. Uh, basically, uh, in in a number of facilities, all the way leading to about 1957, when, uh, where Shippenport became the first nuclear power station to generate commercial electricity. So you're dating back to 1957 when um, your first uh, commercial generation from nuclear power, so it's not new, okay? Uh, this connects uh, my discussion back to Paul. Um, so he uh, described to you a little bit about the fuel cycle where you have you know, all, the, all the individual pieces. You have your mining and milling, uh, the formation of UF6, this gas that enables you to do the enrichment. And he talked a little bit about the enrichment process. Uh, the, the, uh, uh, eventually you do the enrichment because if you don't enrich the process then you can't run your reactors for 18 to 24 months which is how long you want to run some of these large facilities at a thousand megawatts um, and uh, eventually you have to reform this gas into ceramic uh, UO2 uranium dioxide that goes into the fuel bundles uh, also described by Paul and so this is fabricated you fabricate the fuel and then you put this into the reactors and so a typical reactor today 
in this country is a uh, 1,000 megawatt electric generating facility, which translates roughly to three times uh, that thermal energy, because most of these systems are at the mercy of the Carnot cycle, and so the efficiency of, of going from uh, thermal heat to electrical generation is about a third, and so you get 1,000 out for 3,000 in. Um, eventually, you know, you, you, we talked about the the, the, the various process, the, the, the uh, once through cycle, that basically you bury the stuff after you're done with it, or you have the options of reprocessing and going back here. So I'm gonna focus on this piece right here. Um, historically, if you look at, at, at uh, from the 1950s when ship and port first started, uh, what you'll see is uh, what we refer to as generation one reactors. And so you have Dresden, Fermi, uh, uh, were some of the first facilities that came on board um, and uh, eventually went to what's referred to as a, a generation two reactors. Probably the larger um, number of reactors today uh, are in this uh, uh, category. And so in here you have the light water reactors, basically the pressurized water reactor, the uh, boiling water reactor. In Canada you have the can-do reactor, which in fact you don't have to enrich. You don't have to enrich the uranium. Uh, you can use the uh, heavy water, D2O, as your moderator, and then that uh, facilitates uh, bringing the system critical and operating it uh, without enrichment. Uh, the drawback is that you have to refuel every day. So every day you're continuously refueling that reactor. And so, but it's a very good technology if you don't want to use uh, enrichment. So good point over there. Uh, Russian technology, you have the uh, VEER and then the R RBMK. Um, we're not going to talk much about that today. Um, and then eventually we went to uh, what's referred to as the advanced light water reactors. So the uh, generation three reactors in the 2000 frame, uh, more or less. And so here we discuss uh, uh, the uh, advanced boiling water reactor, the system 80 plus from combustion engineering, that no longer, company that no longer uh, really exists. Uh, we have the AP600, the EPR from Europe, and uh, subsequently, after that, we came up with what we refer to as a generation three plus um, reactors. These are evolutionary designs uh, with improved economics. And uh, uh, characterizing these are typically the AP1000 and the ESBWR, the uh, natural circulation boiling, boiling reactor. The two powerhouses that dominate this market, the AP1000 is Westinghouse and the uh, ESBWR is General Electric. So in addition to making light bulbs, washing machines, they make nuclear reactors, right? And uh, they also uh, do the same thing for the Navy. So all the Navy technology is also split in that manner. Um, eventually, uh, many years down the road, 40 plus, give or take, in the 2040 and beyond, we talk about Generation 4 technology. And so the Generation 4 technology is, is uh, uh, deemed to be highly economic uh, with uh, enhanced safety, minimizing waste, and uh, also proliferation resistance. So it touches all the hot points of nuclear power, uh, getting rid of the waste, uh, being not spreading the, 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 the uh, dangerous materials around the world, and uh, being safe so you don't have these accidents like Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl, to know a few, and highly economical. So you, you don't pay too much. Uh, if you compare between the generation two reactors and the generation three reactors, the chart here basically uh, illustrates, uh, if you can read it from uh, where you're sitting, uh, blue, the blue um, blocks here represent the AP600. So it's a, a generation three reactor. And, and the purple is the standard two loop generation two, the older technology. And the percentage here is what percentage of valves, pumps, pipes, and volume and cables is required in these new uh, technologies. So, so generation three, for example, you can see most of it is of 50% or less required uh, components, basically. So component-wise, that translates into savings of you know, cost savings and a number of other things, including safety issues as well. So that was a, a good advance. Um, notice that uh, size-wise, the generation capacity of these facilities uh, rapidly built uh, from very small plants to very large plants. And so when the, the nuclear power 
program had started in the 1950s and 60s, the plants were you know, basically below 300 megawatts electric. And then very quickly jumped to where, where we are today, where most plants are about 1,000 megawatt electric or larger. So that's a, an awful lot of energy from each one of these plants. And so uh, notation-wise, we refer to as you know, small, less than 300, medium size, somewhere between 300 and 700. And then the regular reactors, today's uh, uh, light water reactors are the, uh, about 1,000 or higher. If you look at um, the current power plants operating in this country, uh, Paul alluded to this, we have more than, more than 100 reactors, exactly 104 reactors that are operating in the US today. Uh, here you see all the dots, I put a star in Tennessee. Uh, just to, you know, we are in the Sweet 16, men and women, so that's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> And uh, uh, so you can see a lot in the Northeast, very little out in California, seismic concerns, earthquakes obviously is part of it, political reasons as well, uh, a number of reasons, but uh, um, much of it is here. And um, all of these reactors are light water reactors. And so this kind of leads a little bit into one of the questions that Paul had, that uh, we just have an awful lot of uh, history, background, training, understanding, and, and, and running these facilities. Um, if you look at uh, the total amount of energy generated from nuclear power, the U.S. is the, the uh, largest generation uh, in, uh, of all the countries in the world. Uh, this is old data. I need to update this slide, but uh, the, the numbers haven't changed that much for the percentages. And so eventually you see France, for instance, uh, uh, in total number of uh, electricity ge generated by nuclear. Um, if you look percent-wise, then uh, how much of your uh, energy portfolio is being produced by um, nuclear relative to, to other sources, then the picture is a little bit different. Uh, you can see France at the very top for you know, 78, almost 80 percent uh, nuclear. Uh, and as you go down the, down the line, you see countries like uh, Slovakia, Belgium, Sweden, uh, countries you probably didn't even know that had the uh, nuclear power. Uh, I was recently given some lectures at the Czech Republic, so I left that arrow back from there. 31% of the Czech Republic uh, generated uh, by nuclear power. Some of those BVER reactors that we talked about, the Russian technology is what they use, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So here we go, where 20% of our electricity, which is a lot of energy, is uh, uh, produced by nuclear power. Interesting to know that over the last 30 years or so, uh, we haven't really built any new power plants. You know, we brought uh, some, new, some old plants or plants that had not been finished online, but overall no new orders or new constructions have been started in you know, a good 20, 20 to 30 years. However, the capacity factor, which represents the efficiency by which you'll operate a plant, how, um, how much energy you're producing every day in, uh, relative to being down without producing power, uh, has increased from the 60 percentile to over 90 percentile over, over 30 years. This has been equivalent to 20 plus new, new nuclear power plants that didn't have to be built. And so this is an argument for efficiency. Uh, here in this country in particular, we, we're very proud of this record because uh, we've run the plant so efficiently, but we've gotten to a point where you can't really go much higher than that. You have to stop, you have to refuel, you have to uh, refurbish your power plant. Uh, you do it quickly, but you still have to shut it down. So you can't really get much higher than that. Uh, so what do you do? You build, right? And so we're to the point where you have to do something, and building is, is what follows. This is a, uh, a clip from the uh, US NRC. If you go on the uh, um, nrc.gov website, you can see power plants that have been requesting licenses for new builds. And so you can see here that there's quite a, quite a few power plants, most you know, on the east, east and northeast side, uh, Texas and, 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 and so forth. Uh, many. Uh, AP1000s, you have some EPRs, etc. You can see the type of plant that's being looked at. And so this is really happening. Uh, you know, a few years ago it was just applications and Paul and I and all the other professors that around the U.S. would get very excited to hear how many licenses are being applied for. But uh, I got, I was always a little cynical about it because you never knew where this was going, right? But eventually what, um, there you go. What made me happy was to see pictures like this. And so if you uh, go down to Georgia, 
uh, the Vogel three and four project, you see things like this, uh, you know, uh, uh, containment buildings, uh, ground being dug, and, and uh, whoops, I'm having trouble with this. There we go. Uh, footprint uh, for a natural power plant being built. And uh, so this is real investment. These are billions of dollars being put into action for actual power plants being built. In some cases, even before the licensing is approved. And so people have enough confidence that some of these uh, projects will go forward to uh, go ahead and move on with this. Uh, the Generation uh, 3 and Generation 3 Plus uh, reactors are all very large plants. They're very big. And so typically you have the AP1000 you know, generating uh, 1150 megawatt electric. The ESBWR, 1,520 megawatt electric. These are gigantic plants. Uh, uh, ABWR, the EPR, etc. And so you can see here the uh, System 80, the former uh, combustion engineering design as well, 1,400 megawatt electric. And so the Generation 4 designs, these are some really interesting uh, topics, especially for nuclear engineers doing uh, research and advanced reactors. This is the sorts of things that we would like to look at and study. And we write computer programs to simulate some of these reactors and systems and everything else. And uh, some, a number of my students, Paul's students, they uh, looked into many of these options at one point or another in master's, PhD theses, and so forth. Uh, here we have, for example, the very high temperature reactor is uh, one of the options, supercritical water reactor, uh, molten salt reactor. This is a very interesting concept. I have one. Uh, postdoc who recently became a research assistant, research assistant professor in our program who uh, enjoys uh, this concept quite a lot and has written a lot of proposals lately and hopefully one of these will get funded soon so you can keep on studying this uh, approach. Um, we have gas uh, cooled reactors. Uh, these are uh, uh, labeled as fast reactors, both the uh, lead and the gas. And then you have a sodium fast reactor. Fast refers to the energy of the neutron. So you have Thermal, uh, thermal reactors and fast reactors. The thermal reactors are today's LWR uh, reactors where the uh, neutrons are born uh, from fission at around one to two MeV in energy, but they quickly collide with the hydrogen atoms in the water and they thermalize. And so they become, uh, their, 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 their speeds and, and, and they're slow, relatively speaking, and their energy is also uh, very low. Uh, Fast reactors, you try to avoid that from happening. And what happens is at higher energies, you're more efficient at doing such things as recycling. And so these fast reactors, this whole generation here is very important for the talk that they will be given in, 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 in a little while um, with regard to reprocessing and taking care of those uh, nasty radiotoxic actinites, the uh, americiums, the curiums, the neptuniums in the waste, very small volume, but very potent in terms of uh, problems and heating and, 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 and politically and everything else. In the US, only two of these concepts have remained. Originally, we were looking at all, all of them, and eventually the research uh, funding narrowed down this story to two, two reactors to look at, which kind of makes sense. You know, We had too many people working on too many systems. Let's bring some focus into this. And so we're still looking at the very high temperature reactor. Um, uh, looking at the high temperatures because uh, that can enable the production of hydrogen. Uh, that was very exciting for several years um, to, to look at the, uh, the potential of the hydrogen economy um, and also t uh, tapping into the high temperature of these reactors for uh, process heat. There are other applications in addition to generating electricity. So there's many, many other options, that, many things you can do with a higher temperature or higher outlet temperature. Uh, also, uh, looking into high efficiency power conversion. So uh, not relying on this Carnot cycle with water and, and with your efficiencies in the 30, 33% and building up to you know, much higher than that if you can by using different systems. So this is pretty exciting. Uh, the sodium fast reactor, uh, key is to burn the transuranic uh, uh, actinides. Uh, uh, typically uh, a uh, liquid sodium type reactor. And so you have some systems that are unusual to here. Uh, however, these, these uh, have been built and operated in the past many years ago. So 
They're not that new, including submarines operating with you know, liquid sodium. Imagine that. Um, and so also, eventually for fissile breeding, this is where you take a, 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 a fertile materials and uh, you generate, you make them fissile so you can generate energy from them. And so that U-238, for instance, that uh, uh, you know, most of the uh, uranium and uranium, when you pull it out of the uh, ground, has U-238, and it doesn't do much of anything, but if you bombard it with neutrons, you, you make it fissile by turning it, turning it into uh, plutonium-239. And so you get energy from all that stuff that was otherwise worthless. So I'm going to change the subject a little bit and, and, and put you to think a little bit about small modular reactors. What, what's this whole thing about small modular reactors? Uh, by virtue of these reactors being huge, uh, as you noted, they're also very expensive. And uh, that Bogle three and four project, you know, the order of $14 billion, okay? That's an awful lot of money. Most utilities, most companies that go into this business, they don't even have that kind of money, okay? And so why would they put an investment into something that's larger than they are, right? Because if it fails, they're done, right? And so that's one good reason why maybe you should think about doing something small. So here's an example of, uh, if you were to buy a new car, this works better with PowerPoint, so it's in, in PDFs, so it's not interactive. So you build from a, you know, the, the Hummer to an Escalade, and then maybe to a smart car, right? So we're, that, that's sort of the analogy. Reactor-wise, you have you know, the EPR going down to an AP1000, and maybe, question mark, you know, the uh, small modular reactor might be the equivalent to a smart car. Uh, we've operated and built uh, small reactors. The Navy has been operating these reactors for many, many years. So you see here the Enterprise, the Nautilus, they, they, they've had small reactors built. Uh, the Army has built many of these facilities as well. And so you have several, uh, you know, relatively very low energy in, in contrast to what we're looking at today, but uh, they've been operated. They're mobile. Some of these have been uh, uh, literally, uh, 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 you can produce electricity and move the plant to where you need it. So it's a, a feature of a small modular reactor. Um, we talked about the definitions. The IAEA and the DOE have their own definitions, but uh, less than 300 megawatt electric is typically considered a small modular reactor. Uh, the DOE adds that uh, to their definition that it should be transportable. Uh, it should be factory fabricated and transportable by rail or road. And so, and then it can be operated as a multi-module plant. So if you want to build a larger reactor, then maybe you can take smaller reactors and incrementally build to a larger plant. Uh, benefits, uh, there's several of these. We'll talk about safety benefits, fabrication, operation of fle flexibilities, and economics. And so we have uh, uh, some benefits, and we'll talk about applications to um, you know, smaller reactors may be more appropriate for uh, developing countries, right? Not everybody needs a 1,000 megawatt electric reactor, right? Uh, be very uh, uh, useful, perhaps, for smaller domestic utilities. Uh, the Army, the Air Force, they don't necessarily want to rely on our grid in case of problems, in, in case of a conflict, perhaps. And so they're very interested in having plants, uh, small plants generating um, electricity for themselves. Uh, this is what uh, an SMR might look like. A very interesting design. It's very compact, so it's an integral design where all the stuff that was on the outside for a typical power plant is kind of moved on the inside. And so this is referred to as an integral design. And so you don't have these large pipes in, uh, that can break. And so the big accident that we analyze in nuclear reactors is referred to as a, a LOCA, loss of, loss of coolant accident. And so not having those large pipes uh, 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 basically avoids that sort of problem. And so uh, you have a reduced source term, they're smaller, and therefore there's less uh, potential for spreading if, if something bad were to happen. Uh, you also have improved uh, heat removal in, in these facilities. Oops. So here's an illustration of, you know, this is a typical four loop PWR. You would have a number of uh, steam generators surrounding the facility. Here's your core in, in, the, the, in the reactor, your control rods up here on the top. And so by going to a small modular reactor, you've integrated everything into one single element, so one big tall uh, facility. 
in a comparison size-wise, you know, 600 megawatt electric versus a, a 300 megawatt iris, you can see the facility itself is smaller. It's simpler and smaller. Um, physically, you have smaller components, and so you have uh, uh, no or reduced number of, of, of these gigantic forges. So in fact, uh, as the new nuclear industry was uh, relaunching itself, uh, we found it very difficult to find folks that could make some of these large components. And so that's a, a big, big problem. Uh, you can now, um, if you go with the uh, SMR route, you might have more in factory fabrication, so less uh, site assembly type. Uh, that reduces cost and uh, schedule uncertainties as well. The uh, reduced size and weight uh, makes it easier to transport to a site, and so you can have access to a greater, uh, cheaper, of course. You may not get the return in your money because you're producing less electricity. Uh, however, uh, the initial investment, that's what's retracted many folks from getting into this business in the first place after so many years. So this appears to be, at least to me, an encouraging fact as to why uh, folks are uh, leaning in favor of this, a number of other reasons as well. Um, cost of electricity, this is debatable uh, because uh, uh, larger power plants uh, tend to save money as they increase the size. And so there's a number of uh, factors that you can use to argue that by building smaller plants, several smaller plants will more or less match up to the production of a larger plant. So I'm not going to get into the details of that, but uh, you can argue one way or the other. Um, investment risk, that's important. You know, you build a uh, $5 billion facility or you build a $1 billion facility, then your investment is five times less, right, to uh, your risk. And so that's important. For investors, you know, I tell my students that uh, nuclear power is not generally an issue of, of public perception, in my view, but more so as of investors. And investors want to put the money into something that will give them their 20, 30 percent return, right? And they don't care what it is; they don't care if it's a nuclear power plant. They just want to make sure they get the money. And they don't want it to melt, right? So if it melts from one day to the other, and the money's gone, right? And so that's why you don't invest. In it. So that's a that's a big deal. Uh, Applications for uh, base load electricity generation, smaller utilities uh, with low demand growth, that's a very good place to uh, try to put uh, SMRs. Likewise, uh, regions and countries with small grid capacity, they won't support a 1,000 megawatt facility uh, and installation requ installations requiring independent power, like uh, uh, army facilities and such. Um, also for non-electrical power needs, and, and, and Paul touched in some of these areas, uh, water production, uh, oil recovery from uh, tar sands and oil shale, hydrogen production, uh, advanced energy conversion going from coal to liquids, district heating. There's a number of other uh, possible applications of these smaller plants where the larger ones uh, don't go in. Uh, this right here, I'll just tell you this picture here. This, picture, this, this plot right here shows you the, the coal plants in the U.S. And so you can see here the the red are uh, less than 50 years old and the blue are greater than 50 years old in the capacity of these. And what you'll note is that the blue are primarily the older plants and also of lower um, generating capacity. So this creates a market for the SMRs because you can go directly into this, uh, these facilities where a coal plant used to be perhaps and come in with a small modular reactor and replace it. So that's kind of the uh, an interesting plot to, to look at. There's a number of uh, uh, interests from the US government. You know, there's uh, carbon emission rules and, and regulations that have been put in place. Uh, the Department of Defense is also looking at uh, uh, these sorts of uh, uh, regulations being applied to uh, government facilities. And then just for the simple reason of energy and economic security. So there's, the government is interested in SMRs and it's putting money into it. There's several designs out there right now. Um, the Empower and the new scale reactors, they appear to be the leading concepts supported by the DOE. Recently, the, uh, large grants were awarded to these two uh, uh, companies to produce or to design and try to produce the next uh, generation. They're, they're all light water reactor based, uh, both of these. Uh, surprisingly, Westinghouse was not selected. Uh, that surprised me. I don't know, surprised 
others, but uh, uh, Westinghouse has been the leader of PWRs for many years and, and involved in the Naval program, etc. cetera. Uh, so I was surprised that they didn't select them for that grant. Uh, these are some pretty pictures of what some of these reactors look like. Over time, what's been interesting is they all started very different and now over time they've become very similar. Right? They all look like compact, uh, integral PWRs. And so they all have you know, the core here at the bottom and all the components uh, on the, the upper portion of, of this uh, container. Small pipes, etc. So they're very similar. So we're not going to go into too many of the details of what these look like. Uh, there's, there's a number of industrial um, uh, foreign facilities as well, or foreign companies uh, pursuing these types of reactors. So we have the uh, PBMR, uh, uh, Paul talked about this, South Africa. Uh, they're also uh, trying to get into the small version of their reactors. Ariba, the French giant, is also getting into a 275 megawatt electric reactor market. These are uh, other pretty pictures of uh, fast spectrum reactors. So there's fast spectrum reactors being looked at uh, for reprocessing and recycling uh, that are also um, small. And so they're entering the, this game as well. Um, this is an interesting uh, fact. The uh, first, first potential SMR in the US might actually be built in Tennessee. And uh, we'll see if that ever happens. But uh, so far, uh, Empower, which is run by Babcock and Wilcox, um, they uh, have joined hands with TVA um, and Babcock, you know, Babcock and Wilcox and TVA to build a potential, uh, the first Empower reactor in the site, former site of the Clinch River site. Uh, and so they're moving forward with the design, licensing, and everything else. And all looks very real so far. And so we'll see if it happens. But uh, that's the very first uh, projection for building an SMR in the US. Uh, it appears more likely that it's going to be built uh, somewhere else in, the, in, in a foreign country. Uh, they might be the first uh, uh, folks who order an SMR. So in summary, um, globally, more countries are going to be adopting nuclear power. Uh, there's uh, n uh, several new passive designs that have been certified that be in order in the US and elsewhere. Uh, many of them are, are beginning to develop robust SMR designs. Uh, they, uh, these and, and deliberately small reactors uh, offer many benefits for electricity and non-electrical applications. We've talked about some of these. And then uh, all of these have global and domestic interest. Uh, the key hurdles for SMR, like much like nuclear waste, also are institutional. So there's a number of issues uh, of that type. Um, internationally, this is uh, big. Uh, they offer a new way to deploy energy in, in, in the US and, and, and in the world uh, without this very large capital outlay of dollars as, as traditional, the gigawatt electric reactor types. And so light water reactor uh, SMRs are very likely to be the, the near term and advanced uh, concepts that, that will follow. It, it's, it's what we seem to think is, is nuclear engineers today. And uh, former secretary of, uh, of the DOE, Stephen Chu, uh, mentioned that if commercially successful, SMRs would significantly expand the options for nuclear power and its applications. And so it appears to be a uh, happy time. We'll see what happens. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Sure. All right. Question. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the business case for the small reactors, uh, considering, like you said, the economy of scale. A typical station house, two units of a thousand megawatts each. Well, here's the, I, I had some additional slides that uh, where uh, folks have made the case for this type of thing. And some of the arguments that are made is that uh, 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 by, for example, by having multiple units, the, you're, you're going to achieve some cost savings by having more than one unit. And so the individual pieces will be cheaper 
than the whole, as far as the building itself, not the production. And so some of that will, will basically help align the field from what appears to be something that might be 70% more expensive, right, relative to a light water reactor. So this is the relative cost. This would be what, uh, uh, and uh, claiming that from learning, uh, basically you, you'll achieve some additional cost savings by building more units in series. Uh, uh, you achieve some gains from that. Building schedule and timing, plant design, and then the claim of this argument appears to be that it can get you to about 5% more expensive overall. If you were comparing, for instance, a uh, one large plant versus four small plants next to each other. Are you comparing cost to build or cost to operate or, or both? Or? Uh, this, and this, this would be both. This would be both. Oh, construction cost. I'm sorry. Oh, yes. So yeah, the operation is not included into this. So it, it's it's a difficult sale. But I think that actually the next slide, uh, oops, here uh, provides a, a larger incentive. It's the maximum cash outlay appears to be a driving force for deploying SMRs instead of a large LWR. And so at the largest point during the construction years from the start of the construction, you know, you're down three billion dollars to build a one uh, gigawatt plant, where the the largest co uh, cost is probably about uh, 1.5 billion for a group of four SMRs over time. If you build them one after the other, so again, other arguments that I guess during construction that you can make that uh, make it a little bit easier to swallow, perhaps. But it is a it is a, a legitimate and difficult question to to answer. Yes? Well, not just the overnight cost to build, but your operational flexibility. Let's say you had six on a site to mm -hmm. get your one gigawatt of electricity. You know, I have to shut one down at a time. And so you right. can have five sixths every so many years that, that have to be shut down for maintenance. So right. You a lot more flexibility to have more little things than one great big thing. That is, that is a good point. That is a good point. Michael? I just had a question. Um, in the previous talk, Dr. Wilson talked about how the strength of these security teams and for storing e security. Is that something that would hold back the smaller reactors with any loss of security if they put a lot of different sites, or is that something that kind of is not being that's, that's a very good question. Uh, I think that the, the, the general idea for some of these large plants with SMRs will be multiple units in the same site. So if you're going to build a large uh, you know, 1,000 megawatt plant, you're going to put a bunch of little plants together. And so I think the security team to guard that facility is basically going to be equivalent, I would think. Yeah? You had a couple of uh, potential nuclear plants being built by Southern Company. Yeah. Assuming they get their permission to do this, when will those come online? You know, I think, uh, I want to say 2015, is that the, they're looking at 2015, 2016, it's been pushed a little bit. A couple of years. Yeah, it's it's coming very yeah, soon. These pictures are old. You can actually look at newer pictures than the one I have in the, in the slides. And so, but yeah, this is moving very quickly. Yes? How long would it take to get a license for a, a small launch Oh, very good question. Uh, that is a... Uh, uh, right now, the licensing infrastructure is not quite into place yet. And so uh, the very first test run through the process is going to be this uh, uh, facility that's being planned in Tennessee. And so Empower and Babcock and Wilcox and TBA are going through the process right now to try to uh, define what it is that's going to take. And there's some hurdles there, you know, running multiple units, you know, how many operators are you going to have? taking care of two, three, four units at the same time, um, those sorts of things. Um, uh, so it's untested water yet, so, so we don't really know. But the claim is, you, you, you know, the government is involved in a sense that they want it to be efficient, they want it to be done right. And uh, so soon we'll have a better guess at how long it will take after the Empower folks go through this. Yes, sir. 
previous talk mentioned that the current percentage of power generated in the U.S. by nuclear is somewhere around 20 to 22 percent, if mm -hmm. I remember correctly. With this um, SMR forecast in mind, is, is this kind of forecast by you or by other people to kind of just keep up that 20 to 22 percent, or would you like to see that percentage actually rise coming from nuclear? Good point. And I've been forgetting to repeat the question. The question is basically uh, by adding uh, small module, modular reactors, are we necessarily uh, trying to increase the 20% share that the U.S. has uh, in nuclear power generation versus others? Uh, I don't think that's necessarily the goal. Uh, that may be an outcome that comes about from that perhaps. Uh, but I think uh, there's also aging plants, aging nuclear power plants that need to be uh, taken offline eventually. And so, yeah, th uh, I think the, uh, uh, that's not the goal. Would you like to see the numbers stay at 20% or increase? I, I, don't, I don't have a preference myself. Personally, I'm just happy to see some plants being built. You know, I've been in the industry for, you know, 20 plus years and it's been kind of stale, right? And so now it's exciting. And so even if they build one plant, I'm happy, okay. right? And so that's my own personal opinion. I don't think you want to have the energy portfolio be all nuclear or all anything. You want to have choices. You want to have multiple solar, wind, everything. That's the best way to go. Very popular. <laughs> I have a yes. preference for students. Yes, students right. first. Oh. Very good question. Um, I would, uh, I don't know the answer exactly, but I would expect that uh, we're aiming for at least 60 years based on the current expectations for power plants today. I don't know, Paul, do you know if they're targeting anything longer than that? Yeah. Originally, power plants, you know, they went from you know, 20 to 40 to 60. And then so we're trying to figure out what life of a nuclear power plant after 60, you know, can we extend them any further? And so, so I would say 60 is probably the target. Yes? Perhaps I missed something, but is the basic technology still these little fuel uh, things just different configuration? Yes, yes, for the, for the current, uh, the, the question is, is the technology for the fuel the same for SMRs versus the current light water reactors? For the most part, yes. Uh, you still have, uh, you know, the zircaloid tubing with uh, uh, ceramic uranium dioxide pellets in them. Uh, there, some of the details are a little bit different. You know, the assemblies are a little bit shorter, um, and you may have uh, instead of operating with uh, uh, soluble boron, you remove the soluble boron from the power plant and operate with control rods. So there's some differences in, but they're minor, relatively speaking. They're, for all practical purposes, these plants are light water reactors, much like the ones we've already operated. Yes, sir. So when you showed the graphic earlier, the number of uh, aging coal and gas plants that are being built, and you talked about the fuel needs to be replaced in some fashion, how do the economics work out in terms of uh, whether or not uh, the SMRs are economically competitive with this put in bring a, a new gas plant to replace an aging coal plant? Uh, I, th I would think that uh, the e economics would not be very favorable toward an SMR. They'll be a lot more expensive. Uh, uh, however, I think that this is one of these uh, political situations where you're just not, you know, there's some aging coal plant is just probably not going to be replaced by another coal plant. If if uh, you know the if if our country uh, decides that uh, uh, continuing burning fossil fuels is going to be bad, then I think it's going to be one of these things where you have to pay a premium to move in a different direction. So, but I think uh, I don't think an SMR will right off the bat will be competitive. Maybe over time, when we build many of them, uh, they they might become a little bit more competitive. But uh, yeah, that's my thought. One yes. last question. One last question up here, then we're going to take a five minute break. Okay. Robert, I'll send it to you. All right. I was wondering if you could expound a little bit more on some of the extra things SMRs can do. The question is uh, expand on some of the things that extra things that SMRs can do. Um, I guess some of the 
the uh, the benefits perhaps that, that you could see uh, were primarily related to bringing uh, smaller amounts of power where the power is needed. And so I think that the feature of, of the plant being small is something that you can take advantage of. And, and, and rather than bringing a, a very large plant into an area where that used to produce very small, a small amount of energy and, 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 and potentially destabilizing the electrical grid, you are now able to bring a smaller amount of power. Economic benefits are also um, potentially, for those who want to invest, they don't have five or 14 billion dollars to put forward. And you have maybe one or two, then you can get into the business. You may not make as much money as you would if you had five, but you can get in the game. And so, so economic sizing, um, uh, bringing these plants to, to for other applications by virtue of them being smaller, uh, you can bring them to you know to 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 other applications other than electricity, perhaps. District heating, uh, and so that's sort of some of the things that first come to my mind. <coughs> but otherwise, they're, they're quite similar to, to the light water reactors. So they're not dramatically, you know. Uh, safety, you know, the safety, we talked about how the components are basically uh, brought all together into an integral design. So the technology itself, uh, will be uh, safer and easier to operate, uh, less likely to have a large uh, 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 steam break, uh, you know, a loca, a loss of coolant accident. And so, so there's a number of features that, that are sold with that type of plant. But in principle, it's still water being boiled or heated up to, uh, to produce, uh, to rotate a turbine. Great, thanks. Let's take a five-minute break. <laughs> I'm sorry it took so much time. I just